Welcome back to another episode of Bash in the Brain. This is Bashamania, and this episode is brought to you by Beat the Streets. Beat the Streets makes a lifelong impact on more than 2,500 New York City boys and girls through their free year-round programs. You can help thousands of underserved New York City youth experience the life-changing power of wrestling with a tax-deductible donation to Beat the Streets, which has set a $250,000 goal for its year-end compa- campaign. Make your donation today at btsny.org. That's btsny.org. If you're making some year-end contributions, doing some holiday season giving, the folks that Beat the Streets are doing great things. So help them out at btsny.org. Org. All right, we're back, bashing the brain on a cold northeast snowy morning. You got snow there, right? Dude, I don't even know. I'm in the, I'm in the dungeon. I'm in the basement. I don't even know. Well, see, I I landed at like, um, I landed at like, um, I got in at like midnight thirty, and uh, woke up not too long ago. Took a shower. I didn't even look outside. I don't know. I don't even know what happened. That's fair. You're back at home base. It feels good. It, it feels good to be back. Yeah, back at home base. Got a so good we... weekend. We're going to see V huge this weekend, but a lot of other stuff. We got a big duel, number one versus number six in the country tomorrow night. Um, Wyoming Seminary Faith Christian Academy. If you, you know, if you're not a big high school guy, uh, there's a school, Faith Christian Academy. Swear to God, it's it's. A half hour from where I grew up and live. I didn't even know the place existed. I didn't know the school existed. And there's six and, in the country. And like, like eight years ago, this kid that was a state champ um, at a, another nearby school started this program. And little by little, they got this crop coming through. That's all freshmen and sophomores and eighth graders. Um, they're like one of the best teams in the country they won the pa state title last year it's a really small school but their lineup's incredible including freddie bachman who won super 32 and anyway so it's like this little town little little school against uh wyoming seminary tomorrow night me and david Mirakatani uh on the call it's gonna be a good one but CKLV, that lots of other stuff well you want to you want to like battle me on some cyhawk stuff too don't you well, the thing I, I love about you is the same thing I hate about you, which you want to talk wrestling 24-7. And you text me Sunday, and you're like, yo, let's do a show up to the duel. And I'm like, okay, but let's wait until the Bills-Eagle game is at least over. And the Bills-Eagles game ended, and you never said yes or no. You just, like, yeah. you left me on red, and then all of a sudden the show went up. So I didn't get yeah. a chance, but it's good because there's a lot of talk. There's a a lot of talking points. We'll just talk about a couple of them because I don't know if people are over the Cyhawk duel. But it's hard to get over. It's hard to get over. I, I called Maricatani the other day. If you don't know David Maricatani, he um, does a show for he does a lot. He's in the National Wrestling Hall of Fame. He's a uh, D three coach and uh and um his dad was a like a legend, but he does podcasts up for um, the Matt.com and stuff. Anyway, I called him to talk about a couple things, Hall of Fame duels and this weekend's duel. And um this was like this was yesterday, and I'm like, "Hey, how's it going?" He's like, "Good, dude. Listen, we got to talk about this Cyhawk duel. This is this is three days later. He went through every match before I could say a word. He went through the whole lineup, and that duel had a big lasting impression on people. Well, I'll tell you what. One thing that is a talking point is that I, I love that what you just said. He wanted to talk about the matchups because a lot of what you're seeing now is the wrestling world loves to just tear everything apart. Everybody likes to tear it apart. And I am definitely, you know, no exception to being critical of when flow fails, when somebody else does something, when I think a club is missing something. Like, I, I'm very vocal to try to be supportive. We also, and you were kind of not leading the train, but you you hopped in with, with the um, ESPN critique. I thought ESPN, first of all, did an amazing job. No, no, no. I thought they did. I thought they did great. I thought they did great. I just don't. I mean, if people, if you want to say, well, Willie, you just don't like Quinn Kessnich. Fair point. I don't. I don't like him. I think. I think there's a tremendous opportunity. The the pinnacle, the highest ratings of the year go to ESPN for NCAs, and they get this guy Quinn, and he's like. 
I bet you every year at the NCAA tournament, their production, ESPN's production, the whole wrestling world goes, it was really great, but you know what? That guy. And it's been that way for a decade. But you you went in on (sighs) Let's Not Go Crazy and how well their production was. I thought the production itself, overall, the graphics package, the smoothness, all that was phenomenal. That was... The the, the sure. production of the actual duel was very much NCAA Finals esque. It had that same feel. Good graphics, you know, great commentary, all that. I, I'm not, you know, I do think post match interviews are very tough. I do think it's something that certain questions are not going to get answered, and certain like if you were asking certain questions after that duel, I'm not sure that the kids answer those questions. Yeah, but you and I'm not ask, defending Quint. I'm just you saying. Ask David Carr mid duel what if the duel wins important? What are you talking about? He asked David Carr if the duel wins important. I saw uh, your quote tweet. This Monday Night Football game is all knotted up at ten nine. <laughs> that was just that was what he said to David. He goes, <laughs> David, this is all knotted up here. Ten nine. Uh, what would a duel meet win I mean? They're like, uh, would it do, what, is a duel meet win big? For, like what? You had all this time to prepare, and that's what you come up with. But I do think that ESPN overall did a great job. And sure. I do think that I saw the ratings come out. I think it was like 250,000 people, which I thought incredible. Nomad and some others were kind of poo-pooing it. I think Spay was saying something about, you know, like whether or not the production value or the production cost. This is November. This is a very early season duel. Oh, that's the mar- That's so stupid. You know what? They're, 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 that's, that's fear. This is early season November going head to head with the Bills Eagles with a dual meet with a dual meet that only had one top 10 matchup. I I thought to get a quarter of a million people to tune into that duel on a Sunday, November was awesome. And I don't think ESPN is setting the bar at saying, oh, we're capped out at a quarter of a million people. I I just I don't think that I think that I guarantee I I guarantee I said it on the First show I did too the, after the duel. I guarantee you, the impressions that they got, the metrics, all spell to ESPN. Yeah, we got to do more of this. Yeah. And I don't think ESPN can get any Big Ten home duel rights. Big Ten Network retains the rights for all home Big Ten dual meets. So we're we're not going to see an ESPN host a a Penn State Iowa like we'd like to see. And that's not because ESPN's Iowa not. State, or, or an Iowa State at Iowa, right? Correct. I mean, that's not gonna And that's not a lack of interest on ESPN's part. That's just Big Ten owning those rights, and they are not going to relinquish them anytime soon. Well, you know what? You know what's good about it is you got a quarter of a million people watching, perhaps more. Um, you got a whole lot of online interest. Next year when the dual meet, when Iowa State, I was at Iowa, it only helped as a, it being on ESPN can only help drive interest for next year, right? Totally. And there's, you know, a couple small points. I, I don't agree with Martin that um, they should have used Stalemate's video to set the stage I, within the broadcast. They should have shared that during the week. I would have been all in favor if ESPN said, hey, check out this video Stalemate's did that kind of set the stage for this weekend. Once the dual meet starts... The stage has already been set. You're not gaining viewers on a Sunday at three o'clock because you start the broadcast with well, dresser yeah. versus brands. Well, if they maybe. shared that, if they shared that Friday, Saturday, and said, "Watch this video, then tune in Sunday," sure. But ESPN yeah. kept that broadcast concise and smooth. The opposite of the All Star Classic, which was a disaster as far as timing. I fell asleep three times. So I yeah. thought like the duel and the timing like was great. I do think ESPN could do a better job of you know I mean, trying yeah, to. There was, there was little to no promotion by ESPN in the run up, right? I, I didn't yeah. see too much. No, of there, there's none. And to be fair, they ESPN often kind of like this flow model. They use their commentary to build the product. So they use College Game Day to build Ohio State, Michigan. They don't have an ESPN commentary product whatsoever for wrestling. So I think that's why we don't see the buildup. But there's no reason that, you know, the wrestling community on Twitter alone has a huge reach combined that could yeah. could do numbers. You don't need. Well, listen. 
maybe they needed they were testing the waters right maybe if they Agreed. liked the numbers they saw maybe they promoted yeah remember this is the first time division one wrestling other than ncaa's the first time a dual meet's been on espn ever Hey, I will say, too, if they're interested in commentary leading up to an event, Bash in the Brain does have a number. They can make an offer on yeah. getting and Bash in the Brain on ESPN. I saw, I saw graphics. Uh, or I shouldn't say graphics. I saw social media. ESPN, Division One Wrestling. We're streaming this many this year, right? I mean, they're, t they're pushing it a little bit. Not maybe yeah. this particular dude. They're, they're saying, hey, over here, we got wrestling. Yeah. No, I agree. So, overall, I thought the duel was good. You already recapped the duel individually, so we don't need to go into that. I did see since your event, um, Gabe Arnold completely poo-pooed you and said, Willie, I love you. I never go in 184 again this year. Drop that idea right now. <laughs> no, I'll tell you what. It was good to get clarity. I don't. I mean, I don't care yeah, no. Gabe I love that he did I'm that. Glad, I'm glad that Gabe said, hey. I love that. Let's stop that noise. You know what? The worst thing in wrestling, and particularly college wrestling, everybody keeps things a secret. I put it out there. I put it out yep. there. I Listen, for Iowa to maximize their points this year, Gabe should go. Gabe could go. Gabe can wrestle these guys. Um, everybody's asking. Gabe, 74, 84, this year, next year, red shirt. I tweeted a video of it or a clip of my show. Gabe comes out. He, he gives clarity, right? At least a little bit of clarity. So I loved it. No, I loved it too. Um, okay, I, I want to pick a bone real quick because I was so pissed off yesterday. And the fun thing about having a podcast is being able to rant about it. I emailed Rich Bender and Gary Abbott yesterday because this nonsense of all of a sudden hiding registrations is so stupid. And Gary Abbott saying he's on vacation. Let's talk about this next week, blah, 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 blah. All of a sudden, you know, we, we've talked a lot about registrations and how much that's helping wrestling. You talk about an event. And as you have registrations over the course of two, three weeks, you get to promote it individually on a level of like yesterday, for example, registrations are, are very slowly coming out for senior nationals. Seth Gross is up at 65. That's an interesting talking point that if you just wait till next week and you have 100 guys registered, a lot of topics, you can only talk so much about it. You right. need There's to... A shelf life. Not a shelf life, but if it comes out on a Tuesday, you're talking about it on a Wednesday. If it, if it doesn't come out for a week or, or you don't have the opportunity to talk about it, it gets covered up by other stuff. Correct. And, and yeah. normally registrations come out as soon as the event becomes, you know, in the system, you can see who's registered, well, you can see the matrix. And for some reason, they're keeping it private and they're manually well, sending me a list. They're manually sending Flow Wrestling a list every couple of days. And it's like, what are we doing? So I, let, let, let me, uh, let's back up here. I see you. I see the tweets. I see you complaining about it. And. All right, now I got the story. I didn't really know what the situation was, so they're sending you. They're not. They're not posting them. They're not releasing them. They're so normally, them to you. normally in the USA normally wrestling, you see the registration tab. They have that. It's so it sounds like there's a setting, private or public. They have them set to private in the system, and that is never the case. And it's not Flow Wrestling. Flow Wrestling did not tell them to do this. Flow Wrestling is very much on our side. Like, listen, let us look 25 times a day to see who's registered. How do you know that? Because I asked John Kozak. I said, hey, you guys have all these registrations. Were you guys just trying to get these, you know, on your own? He said, no. He's like, I'm on your side. I want to look 25 times a day. I don't want to wait every couple days and get a list from USA Wrestling. And then USA why, would USA Wrestling why would USA Wrestling make that change precisely after the feral in which you were updating incessantly. I, I agree. And I got a call with Gary Abbott on Monday. So I'm going to get answers yeah, because so fishy. I don't know for sure, but something's so fishy. No, I agree. And, and it's so stupid that you finally have people with big audiences, with big reaches, promoting events, talking registrations. And now we take a step backward and we're going to make that private. Whoever is the dumb, dumb at USA wrestling who decided to make registrations private this time around is yeah, just that's what has Definitely no brain they, cells. They either made a mistake or they they throttled it on purpose. And I'm, I mean, 
but here's Listen, the thing. My... I've been tweeting at them and emailing Bender, Abbott, every for two, three days now. If it was a mistake, I feel like it would have already got taken care of and switched back on. Yesterday, it was switched back on for a minute, and then it was private again. So Yeah, that's, that's fishy. Definitely some funny business. I do have a call with uh, Gary Abbott next week to talk about it. They Apparently, he said they're private now, but they're going to be public next week. What are we doing? Why? Why? What are we doing? Makes no sense. Makes zero sense. So we're going to get some Makes answers next week, though, because we, we can't take a step backwards and all of a sudden throttle. Well, you're not going to get You're not going to. I mean, unless there's something you're, we're not thinking of, which there's not. It can't it can't be public, public, public for feral. And then all of a sudden it's, it's public it's, for every yeah. event, not even just the feral, the open right. last right. chance. It's always public. You're not going to get. I don't, you're not going to get the truth, but so, good luck. <laughs> yeah, we'll find out. At least I can, you know, it, it's annoying enough because I think a lot of people are paying attention to it and are also starting to do it. You know, I'm getting tweets from random wrestling fans like, yo, did you see so-and-so registered? Did you see so-and-so registered? That's awesome. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, and, and the fact that the fact that you kept on top of it and, and Flo, Flo kept on top of it too, not – quite as incessantly as you did but um the fact that you kept on top of it you were tweeting about it you're tweeting about it now it gets other people to try to check in as often as possible right 100 so. percent. and it, it also again you know we're not going to need to beat the point to death but it does let you talk individually about different topics and if you spread out talking points as they come out over two three weeks like seth right. gross going up to 65 is an interesting talking point. It's, a, it's an interesting talking point for a Monday morning or a Tuesday morning or Wednesday Correct. morning, right? Where, at, like, for people at home that are watching that might not quite understand what we're getting at, like, U.S. Open week, right? Like, so you, let's say the, the week of the U.S. Open, you got the cadets, the juniors, the seniors all wrestling. You got Greco, uh, senior Greco. Yeah, you, know, you got all three styles. And you're supposed to digest that and then talk about that on on one episode like on monday morning when it's over right um it's really tough uh if they were three separate tournaments you could talk about them for three separate weeks just like this and by right? the way if, let's just say they make them public monday monday the only thing everybody's going to talk about from flow to you to me is cklb <laughs> and what happens this weekend and you know a one versus six high school dual meet like ugh, so stupid but yeah. so we'll see what happens. I I did post yesterday on Rockfin the people who are entered so far. Um, there, there's not I, Titan Mercury needs to register their guys, and you know that's going to be your your real big slew. Right now, there's no NLWC Hawkeye Wrestling Club. There, there's none of that that you're gonna, you know, we need all that. Yeah. So that's the update on that. That's why I've been tweaking out over on on Twitter about it. All right, you want to talk CKLV a bit? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so we have a couple different talking points before we talk about the tournament itself that we were talking about before we started recording. One being that it feels like we're seeing this shift in wrestling over the last couple of years where tournaments no longer are what they used to be, where you see the teams that are entered and you automatically start, boom, oh, we can't wait to see Richie Figs and Jacob Camacho. Well, no, they're mm -hmm. not going. Oh, we can't right. wait to see White Hendricks and Colton Schultz. They're not going. It, the landscape has completely changed, and you've been covering the sport this style a heck of a lot longer yeah. than I have. But it, it feels like the last couple of years are leading to this massive change, especially as it comes to tournaments. Well, you know, I think there's there is an utter mind mindset shift in wrestling over the last ten years where. It used to be, this team's coming to town, you know what you're getting. This team's going in this tournament, you know what you're getting. I don't know, eight or ten, eight, eight-ish years ago, it's now like, well, is it wise to do this? Is it wise to wrestle this guy? Is it wise, um, you know, what's there to win? What's there to gain from this guy wrestling this guy? What's there to gain from going in this uber-deep tournament? Well... Iowa, should we go to Midlands? What do we gain? Um, this this team, should we go to the scuffle? What do we, 
you know, should we do nat should we do national collegiate duels with Frank Papalizio? What sort of game? Um, you know, they're trying to the the a backdrop behind it is let's mitigate injuries and wear and tear and stress. And, and that is a legit thing because there's nothing more grueling than a, than a NCAA wrestling season division one that goes November through April to April, you know, late March. Um, but at the same time, you know, if you're, if you're make or break, if it's going to be too tough for you to go to Midlands on Jan one, I mean, what are we doing? Now, I will you say know? that it is interesting. Like, Penn State is not going to a single tournament this year outside yeah. of the Black Knight Invite Open, whatever it is. Like, that's the only tournament they went to all year. Yeah, I think, I think this year is a little different. Um, here comes Penn State Willie making excuses for Kale Sanderson. But uh, I I think this year is a little different because Penn State 100 Penn State 100% would have been at National Duels again if it wasn't for – they have they have a, some legit guys that want to qualify for the uh, for the trials. Um, but, yeah, you know, see, it takes a general – it takes a general population a couple years to catch up in any facet, be it wrestling, football, politics – education whatever it, whatever it might be it takes a little bit for the reality to hit and i think um it was always you know it was always midlands 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 and then it was midland scuffle midland scuffle and then about 5 years ago cliff king surpassed them in depth and talent and legitimacy not legitimacy in every bracket being really tough. And now finally, like this year, people are like, Oh my God, Cliff King. It's awesome. It's awesome. And now here comes the people going, wait, is it a little too tough? Like maybe, I don't know, man, that's it's early. It's that's early so what are we doing? What are we doing guys? We're going backwards. You're set, right? You're catching on to that other new wave thing. Not the new wave thing that Cliff King's top dog right now, but the other new wave thing of like, uh, that's a long, that's some wear and tear, that's some grind, that's some, t uh, that's a lot of, you know, I don't know. Uh, for veterans, they don't have to really go because do they need that? Do they need that grind? You know, if you're ranked, if you're a fifth year senior and you're ranked third, do you really? What do you gain by going there? And then, well, this guy's a freshman, and is he ready for that? Like, okay. So what is it just for sophomores and juniors? Then? Well, I mean, what are you, what are you talking about? Would you if say you, CKLV is the is the toughest in season tournament right now? It has been for the last four or five years, and um, if you and I don't listen, I don't care if it's Kale Sanderson or Tom Brands or Sean Barmet or Kevin Dresser or whoever. If you are worried that. Your wrestler, it, it, it might be too much of a grind. If you're worried that an event on November 30th or December 1st is too much of a grind, you're a nincompoop because it's not going to change. It's not going to. It's not going to bust their season, guys. Get them. Nothing. About, nothing about wrestling a two-day tournament on December 1st and 2nd is going to like make or break your season, especially with. Especially with the way seedings go anymore, it's like the, you look back and uh, you say, "Like, well, you know, you know, if we didn't wrestle like CKLV, our seed would have been a little better." Like, not really, because losses don't really hurt that much. Quality wins do. So, if I were you, I try to get as many quality wins as I can. If anything, Cliff Keen is a great location and a great timing to say. And I shouldn't be giving anybody ideas because I hate this, but it's a great event with its depth and hitting a lot of quality guys and early in the season that you could say, you know what, we'll get them in now. We'll get a couple ranked wins and we'll see what happens and then we'll pitch count stuff. 
you also have to understand that like it does not mean anything and we've said it every year when there's a, a loss like this it's not stock down for the loser it's only stock up for the winner gomez yeah so i guess that's that's a Gomez Simplified last lane. year yep. was was the perfect case in point. Yanni taking a loss to Gomez was not Yanni stock down, but it was Austin Gomez stock up. Absolutely, it does not hurt Absolutely. the loser early in the season. No, no, and then and then you can play games, right? Then you can play if you if you're the one that picks up a couple of wins, then you might avoid. Um, not that I want to, not that you should, but you could. Correct. I mean, yep. it's smarter. It's the smarter option. It, it is. It's the smarter option to try to post quality wins early with little downside than it is to chase wins later. Especially because the guys that, like, for lack of better words, they have nothing to protect. Like you're saying, gather some wins, then protect those wins. Right. What are you protecting December 1st? Right. Like, I mean, for seeding purposes, let's just take Makai and and – um, Makai obviously just wrestled. He, he's he's sort of a bad example in that he just wrestled the Arsenal Classic. He's very clearly hurt. He's highly ranked already, and he will be. But take a guy like him. Um, in his stature, if he got if he got wins now for seeding at CKLV. Then he could rest later, right? Then he could pitch count. Then he could say, should I go to this one or should I not? Now he's going to have zero quality wins coming out of this tournament because he's not going. And he'll ha now he'll have to hit better guys later in the year. Mm -hmm. He's a bad example because he's probably not going to lose like much at all. Yeah, but I get what you're saying. I think the listeners do too. <clears throat> right. All right, let's go. Let's go weight by weight because weight all weight. all that to say, I'm very excited for the CKLV. It's it's an awesome tournament. I think we're gonna have some great wrestling. Um, the commentary simply was as as it's leading up. It, it's definitely just changing a bit. And I thought it was worth discussing. I'm sure you know there's a lot of poo pooing right now when it's like wrestling fans are getting excited for a potential matchup that doesn't happen. I think we need to change our our the way we look at it a little bit in the perspective is that I wonder what good matches we're going to get versus being, you know, upset instantly of what I, you're I not getting. One thing. Yeah. I will say one thing though. One, one good thing. One thing that helps wrestlers or wrestling fans digest things and accept things is knowing ahead of time. Right. Mm -hmm. Instead of being disappointed that Bennett Berge or Sam Latona or, I don't know, who am I missing? Um, instead of being disappointed when brackets come out that they're not in, at least we, we knew ahead of time, right? Can we shout so out Gabe Arnold? Is now a good time to shout out Gabe Arnold? Yeah, let's, let's shout because out Gabe Arnold. Because I thought that was awesome, that you had a great idea of Gabe yeah. Arnold going 184. He came out and tweeted, Willie, I love you. That was a one-time thing. I'm not going 184 again. Great. Let's eliminate that talking point. And now let's talk about Patrick Kennedy and Gabe Arnold at 74. Like, I love when wrestlers communicate. Yes, I understand they I don't have to, and I don't think that it's an athlete's responsibility to manage conversation on Twitter, but it's awesome when they do. I think it only it's helps. Awesome. Yeah, it's awesome when they do. I mean, I, the transparency is awesome. It lets fans um, be aware of stuff. I mean, I, I had to wonder when he did that. I was like, man, I wonder if the staff is like – Gabe, shut up. <laughs> well, I mean, not not because not because of anybody in particular, not because like Iowa tries to keep things hush hush. It's because all of D one tries to keep things in house hush hush. Well, I will say that brands. I don't know if you talked about this on your show, but brands keeping that little sliding Patrick Kennedy in when he wasn't even a probable and bumping Gabe Arnold up potentially is the difference in the whole duel. So holding well, that was, card to close to their chest and that gamesmanship, we, we saw firsthand what, what that could do. Well, okay, so one, yeah, um, they, they they didn't mention Kennedy much, but one, he not was much, off, Not at all. Not at all, right. He did have an injury, number one. Number two, um, 
right? All's fair in love and war, right? Uh, w- with a dual meet like that, I, I don't blame him for playing it close to the vest, uh, keeping that information in house. Um, but a couple of us caught on, right? I tweeted, "Hey, they should use Kennedy before yeah, the duel." Hundred percent. And that, some people were saying, for like for me specifically, why didn't you predict, you know, it to be closer? You're listen for me. I'm going off the probables. I'm going off what I see. And and with a Patrick Kennedy, Gabe Arnold, 1-2, that definitely changes the whole preview. So I thought yeah. Iowa State got the win or would have gotten the win if you had told me Patrick Kennedy, Gabe Arnold was an option. That definitely changes yeah. things. I don't know if I would have went like Iowa. One, but um, That's the – listen, there's nothing, there's nothing but upside to guys having five dates – um, as freshmen, red shirts, there's nothing but upside there. It gives more and more excitement. You get an early look at your stars. You have less forfeits. You have um, more engagement, more surprises. The only downside of it is you hardly ever know. You hardly ever yeah. know if, like, <clears throat> like I was Pickums this week for Pitt, Illinois. Well. If Pitt use if if Illinois uses Cannon Webster and and Braden Skulls, uh, it's an entirely different duel. So um, that, yeah, that's kind of tough. But you know, <clears throat> one thing we haven't talked about yet this season, and we we are going to bring this up first semester for the next f- three or four years. We talked about it a little bit last year. This season it hasn't come up yet, but it is asinine to me that if you are a a true freshman that's in red shirt, you get five dates. But if you're a junior that's been there for four years and you're not a starter or or like you're trying to preserve a red shirt, you can't get five dates. I mean, what are we doing? I mean, what are we doing? This guy's, this guy's spending his career there. He could wrestle a duel, help his team, get a spot start. What let his family be proud. He's being a starter. And uh, but the, the the true freshman can do it, but the junior can't. Stupid. Yeah, no, I agree. All right, let's talk some CKLV. Yeah, hundred and twenty five pounds. We kind of touched on it already. That's why we kind of went on a tangent with no Richie Figs, no Jacob Camacho. We still have a great field. Um, Matt Ramos is going to be interesting to watch. You've got Brett Unger, Michael D'Agostino, Caleb Spith, um, Terakina, Volk. You got a lot of interesting uh, guys at this weight. Did we lose yeah, you? And Where'd your video go? Did, I, did you lose me? Yeah, I'm seeing a black Hold screen. Hold on here. <laughs> but you there hear me. Go. Yeah, I, I, we didn't lose audio. Okay. All right, looks like your video's back. Well, I had a little blip. Um... You know what's interesting? At one twenty-five, there's again. actually in- oh man. Well, <laughs> well, bear with me. Got a little. Uh, we're back in the studio. Maybe a little kinks here. Um, normally, if you said there is any weight for any weight, normally if you said there's four returning All Americans here. Right? That's pretty awesome. But a lot, several of the All-Americans here have been uh, enigmatic, right? Mm-hmm. You got me? I got um, no video, but I, I so, got what you're saying. Right. D'Augustino, AA two years ago. Uh, Brandon Kaler, AA uh, last year or two, two years ago. Um, and he's talking, taking some wins and losses, uh, some losses. Eddie Van Tresk has been not great this year after AA in, right? Uh oh, did I lose you? I not still here. got, I still I'm got just, no video for you. I'm a, I'm a little glitchy. I'm a little glitchy, but um, 125 has been really weird and and wide you know, open. I wrote in a, a weird and wide open, and 
I wrote, like, maybe we could gain some clarity here, but the odds are that it's going to be... <clears throat> There's some excitement that comes with it. Like, it's frustrating the uncertainty, and it's frustrating the, like, man, we can't really make sense of this. But it's also awesome because you don't know what's going to happen. Right. No, it's wide open. It's one of those weights that's, like, it, it's really fun to just kind of sit back and watch because anything goes. There, there's not even a heck of a lot to, you know, you got guys in there like Terrakino who just took a tough loss to Drake Ayala. What could he do? Like you mentioned, guys who've AA'd in the past. You got Van Tresk who's taking some losses. This is one of those weights that's kind of like, honestly, just sit back and watch and see what happens. You'll probably have more to talk about after this weight than before. Like Ramos, Ramos is for sure the top dog, and he's a top seed. But yeah, the second guy is the Augustino who didn't AA. The third seed is Unger who was blood round. Um, fourth, the fourth seed is Caleb Smith who's coming over from App State and who you could see make jumps. Jory Volk wrestled as a true freshman last year. Kaler is a former All American, but um, took some losses this year. He had some ups and downs. Um, beat Ayala, but also lost to somebody, man, I forget who he lost to. Um, Tanner Jordan's a seventh seed. He just beat Patrick McKee. Tara Kina, um beat Ayala, but, or lost to Ayala, but also beat uh, Barnett, who's an AA. Um, you know, there's so many people to talk about. You know, in the pre-seeds, Eddie Van Trusk is a 16th seed, and he's uh, the second highest returning AA, and he's a 16th seed. Crazy. Um, I, I frankly am going with Ramos all day. Same. Um, yeah, this is one of those weights where I think yeah. the favorite, <clears throat> you know, Ramos, I think, is a big favorite. And then, like I said, it's going to be fun to kind of sit back and watch this weight play out. It's weird because he's – I would think he's the favorite. I would think everybody picks him. <laughs> But nobody's surprised if he goes down because sometimes he goes down. <laughs> yeah, he dropped matches to Marcus Blaze and Camacho. Um, and, you know, he looked good last week at the Classic. I, I picked Noto um, because of those losses, and he ended up beating Noto. So I, I don't want to say you don't know what Ramos you're going to get because the dude just lets it fly. It's not like when he loses, he's, he's necessarily wrestling bad. I think more so he's getting out-wrestled. So it's not necessarily like Josh Allen. What Josh Allen are we going to get? The one who throws interceptions yeah. or touchdowns. I think sometimes he's just letting it fly and he's getting out wrestled in some of these matches. I think Matt Ramos could be anywhere on that podium in March, and I think he could be anywhere on that podium this weekend. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll, I'll take Ramos over. Man, so Smith, I, Smith and Volk are the guys I'd like to pick. But they're on the same side. Um, but I guess I'll go, let's say, 10-7-2. Man, I'd like to see Spratly make a run. Um, I'd like to see Spratly make a run. But I'll go Ramos over Unger. All right. Yeah, I like that. I don't necessarily disagree. Ramos over Unger. 133, uh, Dayton Fix is similarly a um, pretty big favorite. Now, we lost probably what would have been the second and third seeds here, or the first and first and third or second and third in Vito and Latona. So Dayton Fix is a four-time All-American. Kyle Rini, uh, the two seed, is an All-American. They're the only um, returning All-Americans. Um, Evan Frost surprisingly to me, is the three seed. Can I ask you a question? Yes. Anytime. Is Dayton Fix the best college wrestler to not win an NCAA title? Asterisk because well, he could win it this year, but he's been in the finals yeah. three times. Is he the best to not win one? I think he is. If it happens this year, it's by far next topic. Next topic. It, I mean, it's yeah. there's been debate over the years. There's been debate over the years. <clears throat> you know, my BFF, Brian Snyder, lost in overtime in NCAA. He was a four-time All-American, four-time Big 12 champ, 
lost in OT rideouts under the old rules back to back years. Um, he's my pick as a top guy to never do it, to never get this title. And I was even talking to him, and he brought it up. He's like, he's like, I might lose my title. And I said, What title? He goes, Best guy to never win it if Dayton doesn't win it this year. Yeah. It's a foregone conclusion. I mean, it's a it's a next topic if it doesn't happen. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, so yeah, this weight was one of those ones eyeing leading up to it. You see Cornell, you see Oklahoma State going to the tournament. You're hoping can we see Vito fix? Can we see Vito fix? We're not. Um, so I think that makes fix a pretty big favorite here, but you do have guys, you know, Kai Oreen has been very fun at the NCAA tournament. Evan Frost just had a big win. You've got some guys in here that could be fun to watch. Buzakis, what can he do? Can he rebound a little bit? Well, I think it's um, 125 is a weight that we're going to learn a lot. 133, I think, is another weight where guys have a really big opportunity. Um, not only f not only front side, because somebody's going to be in the finals opposite Dayton, and whoever that guy is uh, – is going to be well regarded, and and for the guys like I don't know Angelo Rini, uh, Dom Zacone, Brandon Freddie, Gabe Wisenhut, um, Clary, um, Jacob Van D. Those guys have a big opportunity here, especially with without Vito and and Latona to make a deep run and make a name for themselves. Um, everybody's going to pick Dayton. Can one of these other guys? I mean. On paper, Dayton's on. Nobody's picking him off, right? But Orini is not like totally unbeatable. Um, can Orini beat an Orini? Can a can a Frost beat an Orini? Um, that if something like that were to happen, then you have a guy that's jumping tears, right? Yeah. Jumping conception. So it's it's a fun weight in that regard. Yeah, no, I agree. I wanted to say fix over Areen in the finals, but I think that's going to be a potential semi, right? What's uh? No, no. they're one two right now. They're yeah, one okay. two right now. I'm, th I'm oh, thinking oh. of their rankings. Oh, okay. So, Reeny from Columbia is a guy I like, but also Claybov, Julian Claybov, Angelo Reeny is a quarter. Um, and then the semi will be fixed versus Clay over Rini. So um, that's a tough – they're on the same side. So I'll go – man. You know, Fix is going to go Buzakis. That's a high-profile matchup anyway, right? You take – at this point, you take Fix all day. But that's a, a – speaking of Buzakis, Team Greco, um, that's a high-profile matchup. You pick Fix, but – that's a fun path for him. Um, Fix goes Buzakis and then Claybo Verini. Um, but man, it's it's hard to pick. It's hard to pick the other side. I, I'll go Orini, NC State, uh, just because he's the most proven. So Fix over Orini yep. there. I agree. All right, forty-one. One, yeah, forty-one. You got Lachlan. Uh, you got. Several All Americans here. Lachlan was the highest returning. Brock Hardy is the two seed. Mendez is the three. He was an All American at 33 last year. Then you got Ryan Jack, Kale Happel, Cal Miller, Vince Cornella, Josh Coderhan, Anthony Echemendia, the eight nine. So uh, Coderhan, Echemendia, the eight nine winner gets Lachlan. And that's, you know, if, if Echemendia. Uh, this is where the tournament starts heating up for me. Yeah, if Echemendia beats Coderhan now, Lacklin Lacklin beat Coderhan at the All Star Classic, is that right? Yes. Yep. That was a point. Yeah, and it was a relatively close match. So, um, the two things there: if if Echemendia can beat Coderhan, that's a really good win for him. I mean, it's a it's a good solid indication for him. Um, and then, you know, he just went toe to toe with Real, and. He has a, another big opportunity against Lachlan uh, and early, quarterfinal, Friday, Friday night session. And, you know, people have pointed out that I've kind of poo-pooed on Brock Hardy. Not on purpose. I just 
continue to kind of pick against him where it's like I look at a weight like this or a field like this and you know I believe McNeil beat Hardy uh, I can't remember what round it was but it was last year at NCAA's it was a close decision match I yeah. looking at this field initially I feel like Brock Hardy could really have a great showing Mendez is going to be a very tough match for him um, I'm always yeah. high on Jesse Mendez, but you know, this is one of those fields where like if Brock Hardy comes out of this, the winner, I feel like that is setting him, him up with some really good quality wins. I like Brock Hardy well, here. I'm picking Brock Hardy to win the tournament. Um, number one, yes, he lost to Lachlan last year, but he also had a better season. He had a better season than Lachlan. Um, yes, he has a really tough matchup with Jesse Mendez. Um, but Jesse's coming up in weight. Um, so, and, and number three, Nebraska always wrestles really well for this tournament. So, yeah. uh, you know, who knows if that trend continues? Who knows if that means anything towards, uh, if Brock wins or loses this tournament, but, it's a piece of data, right? Nebraska tends to wrestle well, CKLV. And so um, I take him over Mendez. And I'll take him over Lachlan. I'll take I'll take Hardy. I'll take Hardy over man. Listen, that side of the bracket, Etchemendia, Coderhan, Kale Happel, Ryan Jack, Lachlan. That's like a mini NCAA bracket. This is right? where the That's tournament a, starts heating up. And really, and really, you have Ryan Jack against Super Thirty Two champ Sergio Lemley as the in a thirteen four match. I'm going the right? winner I mean, of if the seeds hold, and it's Hardy Mendez in the semi. I'm I'm going Hardy, but I also think the winner of that wins the tournament. If Mendez can beat Hardy, I also think he wins the whole thing. I think the winner of that semi wins it. Man, that that. You know, sometimes things work out this way where the bottom side is the toughest, uh, is is the easier side to predict. Um, Hardy, Mendez, Cornella, Cal Miller. But, you know, Vince Cornella is a sneaky guy. Vince Cornella is a sneaky guy, right? Uh, there's no easy pass. For Hardy got to go through Cornella? Cornella and Mendez? That's that's no gimme. Um but the other side, we, we really don't know what Etchemendi is. He had he had a good match against the top guy. Um, can he reproduce that? I mean, if you're telling me Etchemendi wins that side of the bracket, my my head's not busted. Like I, like that totally. That could happen. That could happen. You know, he could beat Coderhan. He could beat Lachlan, uh, and then lose to Happel. I don't know. Yep. That side of the bracket is really tough to pick. Yep. No, I agree. Ultimately, though, I'll go I'll go Hardy. I'm going to go Hardy. Man. Uh, you know, Christian Piles on, on – they had a good segment on FRL the other day where they were like, does something does Hardy's performance or um, does Etchemendia's performance against Real tell you that Etchemendia will AA? And Christian's like, man, you got to. There's one thing to go toe to toe with the best. There's one thing to beat the best. There's you know you might you might beat Vito, right? Crooka might beat Vito, um, or you might have a one point match with Real Woods. But that's another thing to see. This style, that style, this style, and then navigate them all. And Etchemendi is isn't Austin on... Gomez a great example of that? Yeah, yeah. Look at he beat Yanni last year and then doesn't AA. Right, you can do that. You can you can beat Yanni. Well, not many people can, but you can beat Yanni, but also be a toss up against seven other guys, yeah. right? So Etchemendi, we've learned that he can wrestle with real woods, but he's a toss up against a lot of other guys. And it's especially concerning when his top and bottom game is like almost non-existent. So people are going to know, like, 
you know, if well, he's going to go in there with Coderhan or uh, Lachlan McNeil, and those guys are going to be like, listen, hand fight like a maniac, and when you get to top and bottom, ride the tar out of them, right? So um, I, I'd like to take Echemendia over McNeil, um, but I'm not going to. I'm going to say Hardy over McNeil. Same, I think but if it, Mendez but... beats if Mendez beats Hardy, I'm picking Mendez to win the whole thing. I listen. Mendez has looked awesome this year. I think he's had six or seven got, wins, I, all I, piss tags. Nobody loves, nobody loves Jesse Mendez more than me. But right now, on paper, Hardy's the pick, right? Until until proven otherwise. I agree with but that. That being said, Hardy. I mean, Hardy has a tough match with Cornella. Cornella's tough, man. Very tough. So that's my pick. Uh, you also need to watch out for Tegan Jameson. I mean, these are new faces that you need to watch out for. Tegan Jameson for Oklahoma State, uh, who just beat Sammy Alvarez in a, in an open and is probably going to be the starter for James, uh, for Oklahoma State going forward. And uh, Sergio Lemley, who is probably the starter for Michigan this year at 41. There you have it. All right, 49. I know you're excited for 49 because Ridge Lovett's your guy. Ridge Lovett's my guy, but... Uh-oh. He's he's the one seed, and he the 4-5 is Dylan D'Amelio, who was an All-American at 41 last year, and Jackson Arrington, who was blood round at 49. So I think it's a really tough... Um, and, then, and then the 8-9. Quinn Kinner just beat uh, just beat Michigan's other freshman, Derek Gilcher. Swiderski at nine? And Swiderski is the nine. So um, Swiderski, who uh, beat Cornella, who I was just talking about last year. So you got Kinner, Swiderski, and then you get Ridge Levin. I mean, again, mini NCAAs. There's not another tournament in the country that – You'll see Swiderski love it as a pre-quarter. I guess no, that's a quarter. No, it'd be a quarter, yeah. Um, so that's just awesome. That's just awesome. That's a Friday night match. Ridge love it. Casey Swiderski probably. Um, I'll take Swiderski over Kinner, but won't be surprised if Kinner wins. Kinner's tough. Um, and I'll take it. But that's is, that's but I, a is, is Quinn Kinner's name so close to an ESPN's personality that you have a hard time rooting for him? <laughs> no, no, I actually really <laughs> like Quinn Kinner. I mean, when he came out of high school, uh, back when I was winning flown, uh, running Flow Nationals, uh, he he made a deep run, made the finals, might have won it. I mean, he was at our events uh, uh, a bunch and really tough. Started out of uh, uh, Ohio State. Um, things didn't work out. He went to Ryder. Good win last week. Um, I, you know, frankly, he's a guy that always had promise but never quite got there. And um, he's obviously wrestling really well. Uh, he'll get Swiderski early and then possibly love it if he wins. Um, and that's just the top side. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a run. Uh, love it has to go Kinner or Swiderski and then D'Amelio or Arrington. Right? You got to – there's no way you're getting to the semis without, um, like, beating an All-American or somebody's going to uh, – going to go through an All-American. And then and the that other doesn't side, include his finals match. <laughs> right. Then the other side is uh Henson Dele Emilio. You know how I was talking I was talking about a previous weight that um <coughs> it, it's it's more difficult to navigate the top side than the bottom side. I think that's the case at 49 again. Rich has a more difficult path, in my opinion, with D Emilio, Arrington, Kinner, and Swiderski than Parko, Henson, and Lamer, in my opinion. <coughs> there's something there's something about Henson that makes me want to pick him to be even better this year, even though a lot of the same faces are back. Um, I think, you know, he A8 is a true freshman. Kozak, he has a lot of, Kozak lot picked of him to win this him. tournament. I was reading his review yesterday. Um, mm-hmm. He picked him I to saw win that. it. That's a, that's, a, that's a really sneaky, solid pick. I don't, I don't blame him for it. I there's a lot to like about Henson. There's a whole yeah. lot to like. Now I'm picking Ridge 
but I too will pick Henson over Parco, and and that's my pick. I'll take Henson. I take uh, who did I say? Henson. Love it over uh, Henson. Love it, love it over Henson. Yep, that's my pick. It's going to be interesting. I mean, so how do you see the Parco? Let's say Parco Henson in the semis. How do you see that match going? Um, I you know obviously close. Uh, however, I will say this. I will say this. Arizona State has been injury plagued the last two weeks. Okay, the last month. The last the last month they went to the journeyman, got real beat up. They went with basically a half a squad to a Missouri duel, and I know. I mean, this could go one of two ways, really, to be honest. Um, I was talking to an Arizona State coach two days ago. Um, he called me at like 7 in the morning. He's like, I was like, what the hell are you calling me so early for? He's like, yeah, I saw you tweeting and stuff. Uh, <laughs> That's fair. That's one way to get Willie. Yeah. Well, he's like, I knew you were up. I'm like, yeah, all right, so how's it going? He's like... Well, when we talked about the last couple of weeks, well, we've been really banged up. We've been going really light in the room. We haven't really been wrestling much live at all. So on one hand, that could benefit Henson. It's like Arizona State's not going full throttle right now, right? right. Like they're not. They're just trying to let's just get back and healthy. Or it could go the other way. Like, hey, Kyle Parker is really fresh, right? He, they're, yeah. they're not grinding. They're not getting beat up in the room the last couple of weeks. So – I don't know. There's some give and take there. Um, but right now, right now, I'll take Henson. Uh, love it over Henson. And and let me also say that this is the middle weight in a three or four weight stretch for a Iowa State that could really prove pivotal. They have a team right now that's like two AAs and a bunch of hopefullies, right? At 33, you got Frost. At 41, you got. Uh, at By 41, the way, you got who? You got. Where's I at 41? Isn't isn't uh, oh Echemendia. Echemendia. Yeah. right? You got, you got Frost, Echemendia, Swiderski, and then Chittum. If those four ball out, or maybe three of the four, right? And they start getting even higher to maybe like blood round status, or like now you're picking them sixth. Uh, Iowa State are all of a sudden goes from a team that you project like tenth to a team that you project six, five, or six, or even getting the Matt Scouts fourth place trophy. It could be. I I might have to, you know, the one I buy, I might have to engrave uh, the brain slash don't be an orange trophy. <laughs> this is too for me. I, I'm torn on picking this weight. I think it's Lovett or Henson. You know, we're we're often plagued by recency bias in this sport. And it, mm -hmm. with Lovett, we have not seen him wrestle an All-American since last March, March 2022 at NCAAs. So yeah. where is Ridge right now in end of November, early December? This is going to tell us a lot about him. A lot. I mean, it's been a while since he's wrestled the caliper of the guys he's wrestling this weekend. Well, it's also... It's also so remember Ridge went Ridge went thirty three true freshman starter. Yep. Then forty nine. He jumped two weights. Made the NCAA finals against Sammy. Then or not Sammy, uh Yanni. Then red shirt. Now back. This is the first time. Now he doesn't he's not a he doesn't cut a whole ton, but this is a first two day weigh in in a long time for him. Mm -hmm. That's why so I'm we'll torn. See. I, you know, I I like that Henson pick. I like it. Do would I be at all surprised <laughs> if if Lovett wins? No. Would I be at all surprised if Henson wins? No. Kozak, listen, Kozak sharp. Kozak sharp. Kozak got an eye. Um, I saw that pick. I was like, pretty. Pretty sneaky. I, I don't hate that at all. It's a, it's a good pick. Yeah. Um, no, I agree. That being said, I'll take I'll take love it. All right. 
57 is the way to the tournament. 57 is amazing. I confirmed with, um, you know, like I said, talk to the Arizona State guys. They, they don't have figs. They don't have Schultz. They've been Figs beat was up a lot. back on the mat last um, week, so I do think we see Figs soon. He was back on the mat last week. Yeah, yeah. He's he's supposedly close. Um, I told Arizona State, I'm like, look, I'm in a dynasty league. I've had Colton Schultz for three years on my fantasy squad. He's my only heavyweight. I've been wrestling all season with zero Colton Schultz. I get zero points heavyweight in my fantasy league every week. I need him back soon. They said I'll be back soon. Um, so 57. I did confirm Teamer, who was banged up earlier in the year, uh, he is wrestling, 100% wrestling. So, I mean, Peyton Robb, All-American. Teamer, All-American. Andonian, All-American. Luan, All-American. Ed Scott, All-American. Top five guys, all All-American. Then uh, promising Sophomore Daniel Cardenas, Trevor Chumbley is a seven seed Swenson, uh, super 32 champ, and one of the top true freshman starters this year, Joey Blaze, the nine. Patty Gallagher, who a lot of people think could bounce back this year at the 10. Cody Chittum, who just took the number two ranked guy in the country to the wire, is the 11. So 11 goes with six. That's Chittum, Cardenas early. Uh, winner gets Andonian. What a That's what crazy, a crazy right? weight. <laughs> Wait, hold on. Hold on. Before we get there, listen, listen to this quad or or this half. Uh Sh- Shapiro Andonian. Shapiro and Andonian. That's the 14 3. Is that not Is that wild? <laughs> Shapiro Andonian at the 14 3. Uh the winner. Gets the winner of Chittum and Cardenas? Wild. And uh, then Teamer's sitting over there. Teamer's sitting over there with, he got Chris Ernest first. Um, and then uh, the seven, which would be Chumley. So Teamer, Teamer's actually in a really, really nice spot. He's going to take on the winner of all that chaos. All that chaos. Teamer, Andonian, Cardenas, Chumbly, Chittum, Shapiro, all on the same side to get the and to get the Teamer. That's insane, dude. And on the other side is P. Rob, Luan, Scott. I mean, this is this is one we were saying earlier. Sometimes the bottom sides. Way tougher than top, top. Sometimes the top side's way tougher than the bottom side. Even though you got the one seed, this is not that way. P. Rob will, you know, he'll have solid matches, but he really only needs one big one to get to the finals, and that's probably over Luan or um, Scott. Talk about a tournament to really establish oh, wait, oh, yourself. Oh. Yeah, yeah, that's that's right, that's right. Yep. Um, yeah, I mean Meyer. Meyer, who's had all this hype, all this hype, all this hype, uh, best best freshman this year, best prospect in a long time. I gave him six stars. Um, here it is. Here we are. And I he won I, a college, one college opens, one junior worlds, one cadet worlds. Um, here we are. His path will be Endonian and then Teamer if he gets there. So. Um, and then to a lesser extent, Joey Blaze. Joey Blaze. Um, I asked Yanni one. about this week because I asked yeah. Yanni, does, does, does Meyer win it all this weekend? And he said, I believe in him. We all do. He said, it's going to be electric this weekend. Um, I told him it's the way to the weekend. And he said, yeah. And he said, Blaze and Chittam are in spots to make madness happen early as well. I mean, these young guns, what, really a, what a tournament to establish yourself. This weekend, you go out there and you have a great showing. That says a lot, a lot. Well, a, a tournament of this magnitude, I, I, any tournament, any tournament, it could be the Shorty Hitchcock Open at Millersville, right? You tell me that 
it's possible it's a it's an 11 14 matchup in the quarters right i mean if chitum if chitum beats cardenas and andonian uh and meyer beats i don't know chumbly and teamer we have an 11 thir- we have 11 14 in the Crazy. quarter, in the, semis, in the semis, right? That doesn't happen anywhere. That doesn't happen at NCAAs. You know, it is funny. Can I ask you a question? Absolutely. That's what I'm here for. You live on the West Coast now. You finally get a great tournament that is on the West yeah. Coast, which is all West I Coast know. time. You know, it starts at 9 a.m. Pacific oh. tomorrow. The quarters are at 6 p.m. Pacific tomorrow. And you say, you know what? I'm going to fly to the East Coast. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Heartbreaking, heartbreaking decision. Um, I have been to everything. I've been to everything. Every tournament there is, I've been to. Well, except the Olympics. Uh, actually, let me show you something. Uh-oh. For the audio listeners, the brain has gotten up and he's, and he's going to get something here. Let's see what I got. Let me see what a Tokyo credential. Oh, this is my Tokyo one. What? This is my Tokyo one. <laughs> Here the whole time I was just like thinking it's the uh, Paris one, <laughs> but uh, I got I got a Paris one too. I went the Tokyo one. That's the Tokyo one I didn't even go to, but the Paris one I got too somewhere around here, and uh, that might be my first Olympics. So, but I've been to everything. And this year, like, the stars aligned, right? I never went because Ironman was the next week, and I was prepping on that and, and this and that, and it made the most sense to do the high school stuff. This time, I live West Coast. It's a short flight. It's the best field CKLV has ever had. There's so much hype. It's the greatest tournament. And just couldn't do it, dude. Had to come home. <laughs> big dual meet, big high school dual meet. Number one, number two. If I don't see family now, this is probably the only time I'm going to see him till after the season. I mean, it's just the way, it's the nature of the beast. There's too much wrestling I got to go to, and uh, I'm not, I'm not going to make it back home for the uh, for the holidays. So, um, I had to see him at some point, and so this was the smartest decision. Heartbreaking. I want to be at CKLV uh, this weekend for my first ever CKLV, but wasn't in the cards. Had to do the right thing. So yeah, fifty-seven way to the tournament. What's what's your official pick, dude? You gotta go. Um, you don't gotta go nothing. This weight is you don't, crazy. You, you don't have to go nothing, but what you but here's one thing you have to do. Here's one thing you have to do. You have to put P. Rob in the finals. Tell me, tell me, tell me the scenario that P. Rob's not in the finals. Please. No, I think that's right. Uh, unless you Will, think... Will Luan is 2-0 against him. I think Rob wins. He is? When yeah. did Luan? I mean, he didn't beat him last year, right? Let me look. I, if it was, it was a couple years ago. That was one of those uh, Kozak stats that stuck out to me. I was looking at his preview. Oh, yeah. That was a, that was a good nugget by Kozak. He listed Rob against everybody. And uh, and um, Rob was like, didn't lose to anybody in the field except no, uh, one guy. Um, yeah, so he beat Rob in 2022, and he beat Rob in 2020, which was a decade ago. Um, but Peyton Rob's 3-0 against Ed Scott, 2-0 against Corey Teamer. That's, and that's where I'm going with it. Now, number one, I think – Peyton Rob has evolved a lot since Luan and him met last. Um, number one. And number two, Rob has had Ed Scott's number. And I'll be honest. For me, the light bulb moment with Peyton Rob was last year about this time at, at a journeyman event right up the street here in Bethlehem. He wrestled Ed Scott, and I'm like, I'm like, Peyton Rob is pretty much flawless. He is pretty much flawless. I've 
Yeah, he has jumped levels. Um, and he and so he beat Frantic. He beat Scott the next week, and he didn't lose again. He was, I think, he was number one in the country. Um, he didn't lose again until that semi-controversial match with Levi, right? And then we all know he was sick at uh, NCAA. So, to me, he he beat Scott. He's proven like three and zero, two and zero. And Luan, which is always always has been a one point match, to me he surpassed him. I, I and, and that side of the bracket, for whatever reason, the way the seeds worked out. Other than that, there's no landmines to me. Maybe uh, Joey Blaze. Um, yeah, say Joey Blaze. But Joey Blaze, while Joey Blaze is talented and stuff, <clears throat> P Rob's a P Rob's a veteran, man. It, it's yeah, I'm going. I'm so, going Rob to win this, but with it's with so difficult for it's so no matter how talented you are, no matter how talented you are, it's tough to beat those upperclassmen that are so polished. Like Peyton Rob is very polished in. Mat returns and little hand fights and sitting out and, and and I mean getting out from bottom and and like really fine details. He is super super polished. Not not as explosive um, and dynamic as a, as a Meyer Shapiro. Um, maybe not even as Jacory Teamer, but he's beat Jacory Teamer. You know, not as not as high flying as Bryce Andonian, who could win this bracket. But probably all around game, the most polished. Um, so for that reason, I'm taking Peyton Rob in the finals. Man, the other side. The other side is perhaps one of the best, best half brackets in regular season tournament in recent memory. Yeah, I agree. Teamer, Andonian, Cardenas, Gallagher, Chittam. Shapiro, I mean that's insane, and man, I'm gonna be really, really boring here. I'm gonna be really boring. No, I'm gonna be slightly boring. Uh, as good as all those guys are, I'm sticking with Teamer and Andonian. Um. I'm sticking with I'm sticking I'm, this this weight is amazing and I'm sticking chalk. I'm going P Rob over Teamer. I'm going P Rob over Teamer. I, I'm I'm gonna take the lazy pick of Teamer. Or sorry, Rob. But nothing would surprise me. It, it's just no. This is one of those weights where I'm also personally like a lot you're you're kind of the same as me, where it's like you have a lot of personal relationships and you find yourself pulling for guys because of that. This is one of those weights where I don't have a lot of personal ties, and I'm just so glad that I can just watch it and root for chaos. Yeah, yeah. I mean, to me, to me, I could see again because of Arizona's training situation and Teamer's been a little banged up. Um, but I, I, I could see Andonian beating Teamer, but I, I, I really, I have a hard time seeing Andonian's. St- off work against teamer who's big and really great defensively um i don't see him getting in a flurry bryce is really great with mick just mixing it up throwing some stuff out there and and finding ways to win positions i don't see that happening with jacory because he's so at home uh defensively um so if it would be teamer and andonian i'd i'd lean teamer You my know, wife Meyer just said could... she's having deja vu with you and I doing a CKLV show, and I had to look it up. Last year, we recapped it. This year, we're previewing it. Anyway, we might have to recap yeah. it, too. But... Well, sure. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, yeah, this weight is just madness. Yeah. I- I'm rooting for chaos. Give me sheer chaos in here. Well, I mean, Shapiro's a generational prospect, and um, and uh, but he has his work cut out for him. Yeah. So I I don't know. I don't know. All right. We're gonna find out. That's why we watch. 
I, I got P Rob over T Rob. Lame. You got you got what? P Rob in the finals. You got winning. But I, I'm taking Peyton Rob. It's just the lazy way out. But I just I could well, see everything happening. I could see Shapiro going on a run. Really nuts. Like I, I this weight is just crazy. It, it's. I don't know how healthy Teamer is. I'm scared to put Teamer in the finals because I don't know his health. That Arizona State room has not been healthy. So until right. we see some some consistency in the guys being healthy, I have a hard time picking them. I don't think Teamer makes the finals, but I also don't. He could look great, and I could be wrong. I don't know. He's so dang hard to score on. It's it's hard to pick against him. If Jacory is a hundred percent. He could win this whole tournament, and I wouldn't be surprised. If you told me, if you could guarantee me, if you told me that Meyer is in the semis against Jacory, I like Meyer over Teamer more than I like Meyer over Andonian. Is that is that is that? Uh, Meyer and Andonian at? could be a 14-13 match in either direction. I know. I know. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. I mean, we got to tune in early, boy. Meyer against Andonian is just flames early. Early candidate for match of the year. All right, 165, it, you know, for early, me. Early, early match of the tournament for sure. Uh, for me – we go from one of the most exciting weights to one of the weights with the biggest favorite where you have David Carr not only out front, but he's just looked so dominant this year. Mm -hmm. He's wrestling smart. He's wrestling tough. So it's kind of David Carr and then there's everybody else. I think David Carr wins this weight um, pretty soundly, I'd say. But everything else that could happen, there's... You know, I mean, you can go through through the field, but this way yeah. is. Yeah, I know. I totally agree. Um, as good as Cam Amin is, uh, David's just electric, and he's wrestling as good as ever. Um, I take him to win, no doubt. So David Carr's top seed, Cam Amin, the two. Uh, Isaac Olesnik is the three, returning All-American. Julian Ramirez, the four, and Matty Olguin, the four and five. Uh, Antrell Teller, the six. Max Mayfield, the seven. Hepner, we, it was, it's going to be a big litmus test for him. I mean, we've got to figure out what he no, is. No, Hepner uh, is not going. Is Hepner's out? Isaac Wilcox is going for Ohio State. That's right. That's right. So that makes Garrett Thompson, Garrett Thompson, who beat Peyton Hall a couple weeks ago, Garrett Thompson, the eight seed, who never – Bash, he never, never qualified for the state tournament. Really? Never made the state tournament. In, either in either did I. We got that in common. <laughs> <laughs> so that makes Connor Brady. So it makes Thompson Brady the 8-9. Uh, um, that makes Hunter Garvin a really interesting guy, uh, one of the top prospects coming out two years ago for Stanford. Um, that makes him the 12, uh, making a Garvin Olgeen. Uh, quarter. That's interesting. Um, you know the thing about Garvin. Let's let's talk about this uh, because we're going to come up with Fishback in a bit. Last year was really weird for redshirt prospects for freshmen. You guys, you got guys like Evan Frost who all of a sudden is a thing. I mean, he's entering his first year as a starter, and he's the three seed here. His results were not good. His results were not good. I mean, they might have been on line with what I expected, but they were not beat Brody Teske, be a three seed at CKLV in the first week of your starting season. Um, Hunter Garvin, not an elite kind of guy, like a top 15 uh, prospect coming out. His results were not great. He lost to like not good guys as a redshirt. Dylan Fishback won a monster bracket in Fargo, then redshirted. His results were not great. But what we're seeing is a lot of these in the first couple weeks of the season, a lot of these guys who had some not great redshirt results 
as freshmen, they're really turning the corner. Evan Frost is doing really well. I think Hunter Garvin will do really well. Uh, Dylan Fishback. Um, so, you know, there's there's a point to be made. Like sometimes when red shirts, when you're a true freshman, high profile recruit, you red shirt. Um, it's a big adjustment. Number one and number two, um, you know, you're red shirting, right? You know, like you're not, you not, you might not be all gas at that point. Uh, you might not be all um, engineered to win every match. Um, but it's, it's it's interesting to note that some of the best red shirts last year didn't do great. And uh, I'm looking at Hunter Garvin as a guy like that. It is interesting, so, too. You have, you know, we say David Carr is in his own, is kind of in his own league here. You do in your crystal ball have Carr two a mean three. So it will be inter interesting to see if they wrestle, yeah, it, what that separation looks that, like. Yeah, it's just that tier, right, of, of O'Toole and, and Carr is so far ahead. Um, maybe not on the scoreboard, but on the in the in the manner of, of confidence picks, right? Like, nope. It, it's Carr. At this weight, it's Carr and O'Toole. And, um, and then I mean, everybody sort else. Of a, yeah. I mean, I mean might be um, like a tier of his own. Uh, let's see what I have. Yeah, I don't have the crystal ball up, but yeah. Amin's you have, kinda... for crystal ball for this weight, you have O'Toole 1, Card 2, <laughs> Amin 3, Messenbrink 4, Hamidi 5, okay. Ramirez 6, yeah. Caliendo 7, Olgenik 8. Yeah, I, in my opinion, O'Toole and Carr are one tier. Cam Amin's his own tier. And then everybody else, including Mesenbrink and Julian. Uh, I'll tell you, um, a, a really interesting matchup to watch here, in my opinion, is uh, Antrell Taylor and Olesnik. An Antrell Taylor, um, you know, he, he won Fargo as a cadet, looked really great, uh, and then took some losses, lost to, lost to somebody at the cadet trials that year. I don't know if it was Levi or somebody. Um, but anyway, he comes in. He's he's a multi-sport guy. He played football all through high school. Um, but now he's just wrestling. I'm told that the ambition to be great is really there. Like, he doesn't leave the room. He loves the room. Um, on one hand, he's wrestling out of his weight class because Peyton Robs at 57. But on another hand, he's not cutting weight. He's getting his first year of starting um, assignment, being free from, untethered from having to really focus on his weight. And, you know, some elite recruits go out there and well, their first time starting – and they're cautious and they're tactical and they're like, all right, let's find out how to win. Not Antrell's going out there and just shooting. He's just <laughs> shooting. He like letting him fly. A loose, loose cannon. And so it's a really interesting matchup where you got a freshman first time starter, Antrell Taylor, against the three seed in um Isaac Olenek. For Oklahoma State, who's an All American, he's a fifth or sixth year senior. Uh, and one guy, Taylor, shoots incessantly. And Olesnik, as you saw against Hamidi, he took one shot and scored, right? Um, I, I think it's a clash. It's a really interesting matchup to watch. Yeah. Yeah, this is an interesting way where it, it is, you know, Carr's a huge favorite, but you have a lot of exciting storylines at this weight still. Yeah, yeah, we'll learn a lot, a lot about a lot of guys. I, you know, I'll take Carr like, um, I'll take Carr like seven three or something like that yep. over a mean. Yep, I agree. Seventy four. Sugar Shane. Sugar Shane leaves uh, leads the seeds at one hundred seventy four pounds. Uh, Shane Griffin one, Carson Karchla two, Cade Devos three. And we haven't talked about South Dakota State um, other than Tanner Tanner Jordan who just beat Patrick McKee, but. Um, South Dakota State had a really nice dual meet with Minnesota. They're 
they appear like 13th or 14th in the crystal ball. They're really sneaky. They got uh, the possibility of having four-ish AAs this year and, and a great finish if all stars align now. You have Cade AA. That's right in your crystal ball. Yeah, they're, they're missing returning AA Kale Carlson. They're missing two-time junior world finalist Bennett Berge. Um, but here, here's a spot we can highlight a South Dakota State guy in in K. Debos, who's the three. Travis Whitlake's the four. Adam Kemp the five. M. J. Gatton the six. Austin Murphy of Campbell the seven. Uh, freshman Danny Wask at Navy the eleven. So the eleven goes with Gatton. Um, that's a good early first round match. Two freshmen Wask and Gatton. Winner you would think gets Debos. Um, the pick here to me is is Shane. However, um, Shane has taken some losses, uh, and a matchup say with Whitlake would probably be closish. Um, well, it's interesting because you know it, it's fun kind of juxtaposing some of this with your crystal ball, and you do have, for example, Shane three, Travis four. So here you could have. The yeah. three, four in yeah. your crystal ball as a semi, you know, mm -hmm. and then you also have Karchla the five. So if he comes out the bottom side, you've Karchla the five and Cade um, Devos the eight. Yeah, yeah. Uh, to me, right, that's a really good point because you have Griffith, Karchla, Devos, Whitlake, all four guys who I have podium in March. Um, so we get to kind of see the pecking order there, and it'll probably directly influence the rankings. I know, although I would like to see, we'll get to see Debo's Karchla. Uh, likely, it does not seem like we'll get to see Whitlake Debo's if the seeds hold. I would like to see that match, but um, I don't think this happens. Give me Griffith over. Give me Gar Griffith over Karchla. Um, and I'm be really interested to see Devos wrestle Karchla. I hope I hope that materializes. I've been really high on Karchla last couple of years, and he, he's continued to not deliver those big wins. Um, I know he, he uh, seems solid, not spectacular, right? Like really Shane, tough to be. Has Sh injuries sometimes. Now Shane takes some losses though in season. Not last year, but the year before. Um, Didn't Shane lose at Scuffle last year? Shane lost to Michael Caliendo last year. Lost yeah, to Matthew yep. Olgian last year twice. Uh, that was, yeah, one of those was at Pac-12. Oh, yeah, yeah, that was that was twice at the end of the season. That was a late duel. That was in the and... duel and then the next week at the Pac-12s. He won. He didn't okay. lose the scuffle, but it is interesting to note two years ago he was at the CKLV and he beat Karchla 5-4. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm going Shane over Karchla in the finals. Yeah, that's what I'm going to. 184 Parker Keck Eisen's your one seed. How great uh, has he been wrestling? He's the number one guy in the country. Trey Munoz, the two returning All American. Chris Foca, returning All American, but coming up from 174. Dustin Plott, former All American, uh, also coming up from 174. Um, Lenny Pinto had a good solid freshman year last year. Really bad one and two NCAAs. Um, he's your five seed. Gavin Hoffman, a former NCAA All-American at 197, coming down. Will Feldkamp, uh, returning All-American. He's at seven. He dropped a lot. Probably, if he didn't lose to Gabe Arnold, he'd probably be the two or three. Um, he's your seven, so that's an early, uh, or it's a quarterfinal of Munoz and Feldkamp. Gavin Kane, a freshman AA last year is your eight seed. That just tells you how tough uh, CKLV is when a returning All-American is seated eighth. And by the way, again, because now now I'm kind of hooked. I guess we should have started this earlier with, with tying your crystal ball rankings. Seven of your top eight are here. No way. Really? Because you, you have Parker, the one. He's here. Bernie Truex, the two. He's not here. 
Folk of the three, he's here. Dustin Plot, he's here. Trey Munoz, he's here. Um, no cells are from Minnesota. I guess that's the one that's not. Um, and then you have Lenny Pinto, the seven, and Geffen Hoffman, the eight. So six out of your eight that you say are going to be on the podium are at the CKLV this weekend. Wow, that's crazy. And then you have All-American Feldkamp, All-American Kane. Yep. Then you have, you know, Pinto, who I have in right now. Um, so Pinto last year beat Munoz, right? Yep. And Munoz podium, Pinto went one and two. Um, he has a really, I mean, maybe a toss-up match in a pre-quarter with Dylan Fishback. Uh, so huge, huge implications there for both Nebraska and NC State in a Pinto Fishback pre-quarter. Crazy weight. Sneaky, sneaky good weight where I said 57 is obviously the weight of the tournament. But 84, sneaky, sneaky good. You know who's really good? Or it could be really good. Uh, and nobody really talks about him, is David Key, uh, the 10 seed out of Navy, who was 23-11 and 11 last year. He's 16-1 and one this year. His only loss is getting majored by um, majored by Lenny Pinto at the Navy Classic. But, um, you know, he's a guy that lost to Hunter Bolin last year, 3-2. to two. Um He's a, he's a really solid kid out of kid out of Georgia, so keep an eye on him too. He's the ten. How about uh, Tony Negron a, is a sleeper here? Yeah, sleeper. Now Negron is another one that you know you saw flashes out of him at one sixty five a couple years ago for Penn State last year. Solid, not great. He moves up to eighty four this year, and um, he looked really good early, but then had a couple of hiccups, and so. He's a guy that could pick off some guys, but hey, I mean, he's not beating Keck Eisen, but he can make a he can make some damage in the backside. Uh, to me, in my opinion, and I know that Keck Eisen had to really, really chase down Bernie uh, in the All Star Classic. Bernie um, died off. Bernie just died off in that third period. Well, Keck Eisen, that that to me, that wasn't dying off. That was. That was a hard stalk in his prey. No, agreed. But but all of a sudden it was time to turn up, and Parker's gas tank was a heck of a lot more present than Bernie's. Well, to me, Bernie got that first takedown, and then frankly ran. Yeah, he tried to uh, hold on to that lead a little little too long. Yeah, uh, and so um, you know those those are adjustments that Penn State will make and always seems to make but uh keck eisen to me is one of the few locked down ncaa finalists that we have um so give me him all day give me him all day but i will take uh foca over hoffman and foca over munoz give me keck eisen over foca sell um I think he's going to excel, not cutting any weight. I'll go uh, Keck Eisen, Foca, Plot Munoz. That's the way Plot's your crystal hard. ball goes. <laughs> Is that how it goes? Uh, Plot's hard because I feel like I feel like I feel like a very inspired Lenny Pinto could beat Plot, but I also feel like if Plot beat Munoz or Foca, I wouldn't be yeah um, uh, surprised um plot's hard to pick uh but i love this weight great weight and that's why i'm picking so many deep is because i love it uh really interested i mean to me to me we're going to learn a lot about pinto hoffman fishback yep who's your pick cat Eisen? park over, over foca over focus same same yep 197. Sloan is our top seed out of South Dakota State over Hydley. Cardenas, an All American, the three. Cerber, the four. Jackson Smith, the five. He's so good. Uh, Silas Allred, the six. Stem at the seven. Geog, Luke Geog, first year starter for Ohio State, the eight. 
Uh, Wyatt Volker, first year starter, uh, freshman for Northern Iowa, is the 12. Um, you know, pedigree here, pedigree. Um, uh, I Trent has been top three or four every season at 184, and I know it's different, guys. I know it's freestyle is different, but I cannot watch what Hydley did at at Farrell and not pick him. No, I got Hydley winning this. I do. I, you know, Hydley's one of those guys who is consistently right there, and it looks like, you know, I. I had basically said in the Bill Farrell preview that Trent Hidley is consistently an absolute top dog, but hasn't won some of those big matches. And then, like you said, he does it at the Farrell. He wins over Alex Derringe in the final. He looked incredible. And I'm riding high with the recency bias here. I'm taking Hidley. Yeah, I can't, you know, you can't say. Um... You can't tell me that uh, Hidley beat Kinchadze and 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 Derringer and outplaced Mark Hall, and then tell me he's going to get turned by Tanner Sloan. And I just even, don't see it. You know, and to be honest, you brought up a good point. It's not even the two-one win over Derringer, which I thought was a very smart win, but that match against Kinchadze where he the gas tank he gets that explosive takedown late at the end wins like 14 10 like you saw his training his conditioning shout out attack download attack atac apple app store google play store attack trent highly does a lot with attack he's done a lot of training to really gear up and and highly is just he's winning the close matches 2-1 against derringer he's winning the matches where he's got to come back late and win 14 10 I mean, he looks like the total package. I know freestyle versus folk style, but like you said, you, eyeball test here. You watch Hidley, the Bill Farrell, very hard to pick against him this weekend. And, you know, another thing that goes into, you say freestyle, folk style. Well, hey, that's freestyle. Um, another thing that goes into it, though, is not just, oh, well, he won in freestyle. It's he won six-minute full gas bangers. I mean, yep. like – if anything's going to prepare like a fifth year senior's lungs, uh, you know, he, he, he's in tip top shape is what I'm saying, even yeah, though it's and, early in the season. And your he's crystal in ball, shape. your crystal ball kind of reflects that with the only guy you think is going to outplace highly year, year end is three time NCAA chip, Aaron Brooks grabbing his, well, fourth. you look at the, you look at the, um, Look at the history there. Those are both 84s coming up to 97s. Trent has uh, gone well with Brooks in the past, and we just saw Brooks like really handle Sloan, right? Yeah. So, yeah, give me, give me Trent. He'll have to get through Cardenas. I think he died. I think that's a sneaky matchup though for him. He, I mean, Cardenas is really good. Um, but I take Trent uh, over Cardenas. I'll take Trent over Sloan. Yep, same. I, I take Cardenas third, but I really like the grid of Luke Serber. And if you're looking for um, maybe some upsets along the way, uh, Jackson Smith has always sort of had Silas Allred's number. But, you know, look at Allred. He beat Max Dean. I mean, this is a, this is a guy that won... Big tens at 197 as a freshman, beating the NCAA reigning champion twice. Okay, uh, so if Allred could knock up Cardenas, that might be an upset kind of upset watch there. But otherwise, I, I you know I don't see a whole lot of upsets. I like Geog, but I don't I wouldn't pick him to get through Sloan. Um, so. Yeah, that's that's my pick. Highly over Cardenas, highly over Sloan in the finals. Yep, same. Two eighty five. So Wyatt Hendrickson out. Is that confirmed? That is confirmed. No Wyatt Hendrickson. No Colton Schultz. So it becomes uh, Lucas Davison, the top seed, multiple time All American for Michigan, younger Bastida. Um, 
Younger coming up from 197. He, he looks he looks like a good size heavyweight now. Uh, Ty Gordon in Northern Iowa will be your three. Grady Grice and Navy the four. Treffin the five. Tig Dolly, a guy I really like, is the six. Um, the seven will be Connor Doucette out of Oklahoma State. He's been sneaky good. He's been sne- sneaky solid. Uh, that makes Feldman the eight. Oh, that's Feldman Kaka again, the eight nine. We just saw that. It was a final second takedown by Feldman. And we're going to see it again. So we're going to see Feldman Kaka. The winner gets Lucas Davison. Yeah, this weight is maybe the most boring weight of the tournament for me. Um, mm-hmm. You know, you you look, go back to your crystal ball. You've only got two guys here in the top eight. Two or three guys. You've got um, what I mean, uh, Lucas Davison, Bastida, yeah. and Feldman. So you mm-hmm. know, not not the most interesting kind of kind of stinks you're really feeling here. Where one twenty five, you had two of the top dogs out, but you have a wide open weight, very fun to watch. This is kind of the opposite. This is you. You're really feeling wide Hendrickson and Colton Schultz, two top yeah. five guys not being there. Yeah, I really wish, but there's so much to learn about. There's so much no, to there learn is. about. I really, I really wish Feldman was on the opposite side. I, I wish, I wish. First of all, I wish Feldman and Kaka weren't wrestling so early because we just saw that. Second of all, uh, I wish Feldman was opposite side of <sighs> Davidson. So let's say if that result holds and Feldman beats Kaka, then it's Feldman Davidson. I'd, re- I'd like to see that later in the tournament. Um, to me, to me, all eyes are on a couple guys here. One, you want to see how well Feldman does against against a whole bevy of styles and and different uh, top heavyweights, and you're going to get to see that. Um, also, Tega Dolly and Ty Gordon. But they had a knockdown drag out uh, OT match last year, which was awesome. And they're two guys um, really on the rise. And then again, younger Bastida up away from last year and how he fares against a series of, of heavyweights. In my opinion, it's Davison all day. Uh, Davison for me, Davison Bastida is a very intriguing matchup because last year Davison was was consistently right there, but lost to the top guys. He, you know, NCAA's he got pinned by Hendrickson. He beat Schultz three one in sudden victory. So those were two matches I was really looking forward to see where where Davison stacks up. Um, Mason Paris, who majored him last year ten one, is now in the same room as him. You know, they're both at Michigan, so it's going to be yeah. interesting. Um, Davidson lost to Cassiopeia at Big Tens, lost to Trent uh, Hilger at Big Ten Championships. So one of the key storylines of for me at this weight is how has Davidson improved? You know, and I think younger, given how good he's looked, he he looks full sized. He doesn't look like a ninety seven pounder wrestling up a weight. Yeah. No. Uh, so this is a weight where I think probably where'd, everybody takes Davison over Bastida. But to me, to me, really, um, in weights like this, the finer points, the finer points of the, weight, of the weight are not so much who wins the tournament. It's about learning about Tyrell Gordon, Tay Goodali, what Nick about- Feldman. How about some respect on Seth Nevels? I, you know what? We're going to learn about him, too. I don't exactly know where he stacks up. I don't exactly know where Luis Fernandez stacks up. Luis Fernandez, talented guy on top, but always seems to come down with an injury. And so um, really tough for those guys. Seth Nevels has not been consistent. Treffin, you know what? You know who doesn't get his due is Owen Treffin. Owen Treffin doesn't get his due. That dude wrestles hard. That dude wrestles hard, so um, he's another one too. Uh, well, you know, we talked about Gordon and Gadali and uh, Feldman. Uh, if Owen Treffen takes third, uh, I ain't surprised. Yeah, yeah. A lot of these guys, I'm curious, can they make jumps? You know, Seth Nevels hasn't looked that great, but you know, he's a guy who 
can do great things. Obviously, you know, I, I'm more his his old Penn State tie. You know, had, had my eyes open a couple of years ago to watch him, but. Yeah, interesting weight. Going to learn a lot about some of these guys who are kind of that second and third tier of the weight. Well, let's wrap it up with um, who you think wins the team race because Nebraska. Number one, it's a fantastic team race. Uh, you know, you got so many top teams. It's the best in season tournament. It's a mini NCAs. You got Nebraska, Michigan, NC State, Iowa State, Ohio State, Oklahoma State, Cornell, Oregon State, Northern Iowa, Arizona State, which is. Um, more of a uh, like a deep they're missing they're missing two studs uh, three studs really and um they're more of a deep deep tour i mean i i said uh i said in a preview um that i wrote on intermat that nebraska has won this tournament four years in a row but nebraska has also in those years been very balanced and very like a better maybe dual meet team with like 10, 10 bullets and maybe at Cliff Keen in Las Vegas in the past, 10 placers. Now this year, the composition of the team is a little bit different. They're more of a tournament team. And so, you know, they got, they got some holes. They got like, uh, Caleb Smith is borderline podium jacob van d's seated out of the podium a freshman they don't have a real impact guy at 74 and they don't have a real impact guy at um at heavyweight so uh when those things when your composition of your team is like that like quasi like arizona state is like arizona state if they had figs and schultz the deeper a tournament is the tougher the tournament field is, the better it is for you because you don't have other teams. You don't have a you don't have a dual team sneaking in seventh and eighth placers. When it's deep, balance doesn't help. Studs help. And this is super deep, and Nebraska has super studs at 41, 49, 57. Uh, they have a chance to place at 65. They have a chance to place at 84, a chance to place at 97. Now, those weights are so deep that things could go awry for Nebraska. And if Pinto doesn't podium, Pinto Pinto could take Pinto could take third. He's beaten Munoz, who's a two seed. Pinto could take third, or he could lose in the blood round. Silas. Silas beat the NCAA All-American. Silas could take third, or uh, national champ. Silas could take third, or he could lose in the blood round, right, to like a Jackson Smith. So Nebraska is a team that could end up with five of the top four and two other placers and win this thing going away, or they could wind up with their only place is being 41, 49, 57. So I think it's a fantastic um, team race. Uh, I'm higher on yeah. Nebraska than Michigan in the finals, which is what I think it's Nebraska one, Michigan two. And I think if what I've said where I think Brock Hardy, I haven't put enough respect on his name. I think he can win it. If Lovett shows up like he was, you know, last March, I think he can win it. And I think Peyton Rob can win it. If those three guys can win whereas if you we'll look even at make the finals yeah i mean if you look at yeah. you know for michigan you know diagostino we don't really know how healthy he is if he's you know there shane i i do think wins it for michigan outside of that you know i think Carr beats amin in the finals and i do think yeah. lucas davison um wins especially without white hendrickson with white hendrickson well, I, mean I think he was the clear favorite for me, I think that, you know, for Nebraska, I think Pinto's the wild card. I think... Um, and all red. Right. But, but, like, if you told me Pinto beats Fishback and then he beats Plot to make the semis and guaranteed a place, I'm like, all right, Nebraska's in really great shape. Sure. If you're telling me, if you're telling me Pinto loses the Fishback and now he has to win, like, four in a row to podium that's dicey because pinto's young and he's up and down 
Um, so, <clears throat> and again at 97, all red. He's beaten Max Dean twice. If you're telling me he beats Cardenas to make the semis against Trent and guarantees a podium spot, the brass is cooking. If you're telling me he loses to Cardenas, then, you know, he could take eighth and, and not a lot of whole, a whole lot of team points. So, uh, to me, it hinges on those. I do think that Caleb Smith probably um, scores some points. But I think Nebraska is the pick. I think Nebraska is the pick. And I think people knowing now that Nebraska has won CKLV the last four years, knowing they have probably the most sure things uh, and paths to get to the um, finals, I think everybody's going to take Nebraska – but I'm also going to warn you, there's there's a chance Nebraska finishes poorly uh, relative to expectations because mm. the weights are so deep, because namely because Silas and Pinto are volatile. Would you say it's Nebraska's to lose? Yes. That's what I think. Yes. I yes, think I it's say, Nebraska's, yeah. Nebraska's tournament, it's Nebraska's team title to lose. And I think if they wrestle expectations, they win. Like you said, if they don't, or if they don't, you know, if they take some sneaky losses here and there, I think you're right. I agree with you. You know, even though I'm saying that it could go sideways for Nebraska and Pinto and I'm saying Pinto and Allred are volatile and sort of wild cards. And looking at the composition of the other teams, like, who has the horses to get it done? I mean, Michigan, maybe. If Michi Michigan's my two team. I think if Michigan, if Davidson wins and, and Shane wins, you got two champions right there. And a mean, a mean second. And a mean right? second. But, but, but hold on, though. Even So that's max, right? That's max. We're uh, maxing out Michigan. We're maxing out Michigan with Davidson champ, uh, a mean second and Shane Champ, we're maxing them out. But who's their other bullets? Diagostino at twenty five. If he's healthy, I mean he's what Listen, Diagostino's built in projection points are second. That ain't happening. That ain't happening. Like I mean he his built in projection points are kind of maxed. Yeah, I'm looking for Right, I did not gonna have anybody come out of nowhere. I mean the 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 best the best out of nowhere guy might be um, Sergio Lemley yeah. at forty one. I guess, I guess where they could make a difference with Nebraska is if Luan beat both Scott and Rob. That would be that would be tournament shifting. That well, would be tournament but shifting. but I mean, in it, that in and of itself, you, you don't just have. I mean, for multiple ways, if Luan beats Rob, Michigan beats Nebraska. That's the team title right there. I think. Okay. Okay. I don't. Yeah, right. That's I don't want. So we found the one. Yeah. If Luan can beat Rob, I think that changes everything too. If Luan beat Scott and Rob. That's that's Michigan's path. We yeah. just figured it out, bro. There we, we go. Just figured it out. That was this, just... this tournament might hinge on how well Luan does. No, I think it will. Well, that that's if you're Michigan and you're rooting for Nebraska to lose, you have your opportunity there to make all the difference right yep absolutely absolutely can can if luan beats rob it's michigan's tournament to lose assuming shane and, and davison are going to win mm -hmm. it's going to be very hard for nebraska to win if luan beats rob we figured it out we figured it out although yeah nebraska probably still ends up at more places but you're right if that yeah. Yep. You're right. We figured it out. Now, if there's a wild upset like Davison or Shane goes down, that's a whole different story, but that's... Yeah. Yeah. Um, Iowa State, too many things would have to go right. NC State, I don't think, has the horses. And I'm, I'm talking... I'm not saying they can't take second. I'm not saying, saying they can't take third. I'm saying to win the thing outright. I, I think like an NC State is kind of composed to be second or third. Yeah. Um, 
Iowa State too much would have to go right. I mean, Iowa State would need Frost to hold seed and and all three, Echemendia, Swiderski, and Chittum to ball completely out. And while one or two of them might, they, they ain't, too much has to go right for them to win this whole tournament. Um, Cornell, I don't think so. Um, I think in a perfect world where they had Vito, I think they could go, come close, I but I don't see, I don't see it happening. Um, so yeah, I have I have one more college note for the weekend. Yeah, I well, want I you to. I want. College note. I want you to give me a line. Yeah, hit me. Chances, hey, I love line. chances that we see Nagal Crookham. Oh, I would say ninety percent. That that's we, one of the matches of the weekend. I think we need to see it. I mean, um, you know, I said on Twitter. Somebody, a Penn State fan said, oh, "I bet you it's McGonagall," which I have. Uh, he didn't say why. Like I feel, I find that really weird for him. Uh, so I find that a weird take. To me, Crookham beat McGonagall. Okay, he earned the spot for now. So it, it was interesting. One Penn State fan said, "I think we see McGonagall." Another Penn State fan said, "Well, isn't this already put to bed? Isn't this already Crookham's spot?" Okay, it's Crookham spot for now. It's Crookham spot for now. Crookham earned the right uh, to face Nagal. Crookham earned the right to wear the Lehigh singlet and start in the dual meet. Okay, but wrestling isn't won by it isn't won by a starting spot. It's won by one tournament or one match, right? So it's his spot for now, especially with uh, McGonagall beating Latona. Um, but here's how I see it. Crookham beat McGonagall head up. He beat Vito. If he goes in and he beats Nagal, then I put it to bed. Like, you beat the returning champ, you beat the returning, what was he, third? Fourth? Third? Third, Nagal? I think, yeah. Third or fourth. Well, somebody, no, somebody beat Fix for third. I think, I think Nagal was fifth. Fifth, yeah, yeah, um, you won the fifth place match. That's right. Yeah, so you you beat you beat McGonagall, you beat Vito, you beat Nagal. I'm saying, the rest of the year, Crookham at your spot. I, he 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 goes out there and loses to Nagal. I continue to have those guys wrestle off, and it's McGonagall still got a chance. I mean, I th- to me, that's it. This is the world. Yeah, no, I think so too. I think you know. Crookham is Lehigh's highest ranked guy. I think he's ranked like fifth right now. And then next you got uh, Michael Beard at 97 ranked 10. Then you got Heinz ranked uh, 10 at 41. So, yeah. I mean, if, you know, Malik, I, Malik a couple years ago, I think he was at 33. Anyway, uh, it's, it's really tough to say. It's really tough to say. It's easy for me to, it, it, it's tough for them to say. It's easy for me to say what I would do is, Put Malik on full feed and move McGonagall up to 41. That's what I would do. Uh, frankly, I probably would have done it in the in the summer. But, you know, in the summer, you didn't know Crookham was beating Vito. Agreed. One other Penn State note. Probable lineup shows Robbie Howard, Gary Steen, and Braden Davis all at 25. Davis, next topic. Listen, Kale. You start Braden Davis. We need to find out what he is. It costs nothing, but one red shirt date preserves his red shirt. Look at the camera out. and point to Callaghan. I'm going to take a screenshot. Kale, Kale we need to find out what Braden Davis is. You need to give him a couple opportunities. And uh, hey, it may be your path to setting a scoring record. Yeah. I mean, this lineup is just, you know, as you're looking at it, I don't. I don't know whose rankings Penn State's using this. As I'm looking at the the release for the probables, but got the Gal three. Pat Pat Don guy has a big brain. He uses internet. He so he's got you got Penn State Nagala number three, Bo Bartlett two, Shane Van Ness two, Levi one, Messenbrink sixteen, Carter one, Bernie two, Brooks one, Kirk one. You got yeah. seven guys in the top two. I'm loving my finals bet with you. I'm loving my odds. Now the bet was that they have seven finalists. Is that what seven, the bet was? Seven finalists. 
And I, if and I they have eight ranked in the top three right now, seven in the top two. And that's not including Mesenbrink. Correct. So if I, so seven finalists, if I lose, I pay you 400. If Penn State has six or less finalists, you pay me 10 bucks. Correct. It's a good bet. It's a good yeah, bet. Yeah, I've, I've, hey, I think it's a good bet for both of us. It it yeah. really is. It like to have seven finalists is a not only a historic talking point, but you get to say you lost four hundred bucks because the the dumbest thing about this all not the dumbest, but is how parlays work, right? It's like you can pick seven favorites to win this weekend, and yeah. it's going to be monster odds that they all do. Yeah. But still, like they're the crazy things that we are betting this, like there's a path to Penn state legitimately our conversation of will Penn state have seven finalists or not is crazy. Yeah. I mean, I, it's insane. We're even having a conversation. Right. Would you, would you like, would you like $400 in cash? or Would you like $400 in excellent, excellent grilling meats, grilling meats all day? <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Um, Man, what else? What else this weekend? Um, Has Intermat put out the streaming guide for this weekend yet? I'm not sure. If there's some, like everybody's going to be glued to um, CKLV, but there's some sneaky. Good what else stuff. did you have in your? Uh, did you do your what Willie's watching yet? Yeah, I did five things to watch. I did, um, you know, Crookham at Penn State. Uh, I did um, CKLV team race. A couple, a, t- a couple of them were CKLV related. Cougar Clash actually has a really good, a really good bracket. Um, it's a, it's a bracket tournament. It's not a duel. And what I like there is um, Missouri. M- Missouri's they have some studs. Uh, and this isn't going to tell us. Uh, I, I said in my crystal ball show. Right now in crystal ball, it's Missouri studs and Missouri zeros, right? Missouri studs and the rest of them are Missouri zeros. If they can get even a few points from Noah Certain at 25, from Zeke Seltzer at 33, from Josh Edmond at 41, uh, from uh, Clayton Whiting at 84, if they can get a couple points out of those guys. It could vault them from six, seven, eight to maybe four. And uh, so while this weekend isn't going to tell us definitively, like, yeah, they're getting some NCAA points out of those guys. It's something you got to monitor in the big picture. You something got to monitor. So that's what I'm looking. That's another thing I'm looking for. I so thought the Cougar cool. clash was something that happened at a bar in Bethlehem. And the Cougar clash. I, I <laughs> Right. I thought it was an adult dating site. Uh <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> they got. Do you see, man, the world. They got like uh, the Bachelor, like uh, Golden Edition or something like that. Now, I don't watch any of that crap. I don't either. I just thought it was funny. They got these freaking uh, elderly home pa- patients by, uh, <laughs> dating on TV. Whatever. Yeah, it's going to be a good Friday night of viewing, though. I saw you did put out your Friday night viewing guide yesterday, which was number one, Sam versus number six, Faith Christian at seven p.m. Washington, yeah. Oregon at 8 p.m. CKLV quarters at 9 p.m. Yeah. What, what, what are your thoughts on uh, college football? We just go off off script right here. And uh, you follow it pretty good in college football? Yeah. Yeah. I'll give you my yeah. um, I'll give you my quick take. Let me see the yeah. championship weekend. It's going to be an absolutely great weekend. Um, so follow do you. Do you follow the goat follower on yeah. Twitter? Yeah, you he's have a, to. He's, he's the go follower. He's a good dude, and he and he really follows. He's a giant Penn State fan and slash yeah. homer, but he's a realistic. He's kind of realistic, but he um, is. uh, he really follows NCAA football well, and and like I, I follow it pretty well, but he his tweets about it inform me. So yeah, I think Oregon minus nine and a half is a trap game. I like Washington plus the points. Oregon State is what? Oregon is minus nine and a half against Washington tomorrow night. What? I think it's a trap. I love Washington in the points. Nine may- and a half? Crazy, right? What? They beat him already. It doesn't make any sense. I like um 
I like Washington plus nine and a half. I do too. It plus nine and a half. I mean, nine and a half almost makes me think something's funny and Oregon's going to kill. Correct. Me. Correct. Like that. That's like what's going on? Something's fishy here. That line makes no sense. I to me, Michael Penix and their and their wide receiver can keep anything within reach. Yeah, I I agree. But wait, Oregon's a favorite. Nine what and a half happens, points. It doesn't make sense. What happens if Oregon wins? What happens if Oregon wins? Damn it, Alabama gets in probably, or maybe not if they lose. Uh, Alabama, Georgia over. Just just take all your rate tokens and just submit them to any gambling site and just put that game over 55. So Vegas says Oregon's going to win. If Oregon wins, Oregon's Soundly. in Washington out and like who the hell else gets in? Texas? Texas, Texas did beat Texas. Alabama. Texas should get in. Texas should get in if Washington's out. We need a 12-team playoff. I, State, this year. Here, here, yeah, I know. Here's a tough part. Uh, here's a tough part. Florida State is not that Florida well, State's not that good. But they're going to be. Not with Travis Hunter out. They're going to be. Um, they're going to be L, uh, Louis, Louisville because they're just. They're, they're just better at most positions. How but about Michigan bad. being a 23-point favorite against Iowa? And the, the over-under is only 34. Oh, my God. So they're saying it's going to be like uh, 34. Like 24 nothing. Yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, I like Iowa in the points. I think if Iowa gets a – if the special team scores a touchdown, I think it's going to be harder for Michigan to cover that. They're basically saying that Iowa's not going to score, essentially. Well, they're, they're they're probably not. Michigan's defense is ridiculous, especially up front. And and I don't uh, think Michigan cares about this game. I don't think I would, Michigan... Iowa can't score. Yeah, that's a good point, too. That's a good point, too. Michigan might not... Michigan might be like, uh, you know... Michigan's all, right, all the, in the playoffs. Here's a stat I read yesterday. We're really going hardcore football. This is Bachelomania football edition. <laughs> here's a stat I read yesterday. You know what Michigan did against Penn State and Ohio State? They threw the ball a combined 25 times. They didn't throw the ball. They just ran every play. They just ran. Yeah. That's what the good Iowa. Yeah, I like Iowa in the points. I also like Man, Texas I, giving up the points. I kind of like the under. I don't we'll like see. the under because if all of a sudden Michigan blows it open in the second half, I wouldn't be surprised. I wouldn't be surprised if all of a sudden right. Michigan has Harborough back on the sidelines. If they opened it up and made a statement and just beat the living piss out of Iowa, I would not be surprised. But Let me ask you this. Here's a good question for a massive, massive Penn State homer. What do you make of people saying – Wow. Franklin's so Franklin's, Franklin's mid. Franklin can't get over the hump. Franklin can't win the big one. So I'll tell you All what. Right. Be careful what you say because I have a follow up question. So I'm when it comes to Penn State as a whole, I'm not a homer. With with wrestling, I am because I told the story a million times. I didn't really follow college wrestling. I didn't go to college at all. So when when Cal moved to Penn State, he was already a client of mine. And I was in the room. He made me feel like family, and I became a Penn State fan. When it comes to football, I have no loyalty and no homerism to their football team. And I was actually talking to Chenzo yesterday because he brought up um, he brought up Franklin being an NFL coaching candidate. And I said it's very interesting because you know. The stigma around Franklin right now is he can't win the big one. But his name is getting brought up for the head coaching job with the Carolina Panthers. But similarly, Ryan yeah, Day has exactly a stigma Penn because... Fans, exactly, Penn State fans. W watch what you wish for, you idiots. I like, And it's what, Ohio, it's what Ohio State's doing right now with Ryan Day. Loses to Michigan three years, but apart from that, 
seemingly has great seasons, but as soon as there's a stigma, college football fans are absolutely brutal. If I'm a Penn State fan, most college football teams would be very happy with double-digit wins. What a bunch of idiots the Penn State football fans are that say, that criticize Franklin, okay? And I'll tell you two reasons why. I, I, I'll tell you a laundry list of why. Well, do you think why? that Franklin's what, gonna... What would you... Penn State's win total and performance in the Franklin era, how many schools would have taken that? Let me ask you this, though. Like, like, like all but 12. Let me right? ask you this question, though. Do you think Franklin has what it takes to get them to a championship? Okay. Or do you part think number, that's more athletes? Part number two. And I know this is there's no consolation prizes, but part number two. How many times did Penn State have Ohio State, Ohio State on the ropes? Several times. Oh, yeah. Several yeah. times they had Ohio State on the ropes. Okay. Uh, part number three. How many – the playoffs are going to how many teams, JB? Well, 12. How many times in the Franklin era would Penn State have, would have made those playoffs? If the, if the if they're going to 12, if they, had, if they had 12 for the last eight years, how many times would Penn State have been in there? All of them. Five, six? Five, yeah, five or six. If Penn State went to the playoffs every year, would you still be crying? Would you, st- you know you wouldn't because you'd have a chance. You'd be in the dance, okay? Point number f- four. Point number 4,000. Look at the recruiting classes. Look at the talent differential between Ohio State and Penn State and the number of four stars and five stars. And Penn State's right there with them every year. Right there with them every year. All you need is one year, get over the hump, get a big class. They showed, I don't know if you saw it, Ross Dellinger tweeted yesterday or two days ago, if we had a 12-game playoff, what it would look like this year. Did you see that? I didn't, but Penn State has to be in there at like 10, right? Yeah, Penn State, I'm going to send the bracket to you. I just texted it to you. Penn State, Texas would be the game. Winner going to Michigan. That would be electric. Mm That would be electric. It'd be awesome. I actually don't think it'll be. I actually don't think after this weekend it would be Penn State, Texas, because I think Texas is going to win. And I think if Oregon wins, Texas goes to the dance. So, uh, but still, um, listen, if they had 12 team playoffs for the last Franklin era, they probably go six, seven, eight times. Uh, so nobody be crying then. You Penn State fans are. Football fans are the Franklin defectors are idiots, in my opinion. So there, that was this week in college football on Bash Mania. It's going to be a very exciting week. I can't wait, and I'm so glad it starts tomorrow night with uh, Oregon, Washington. I know, dude. Oregon, Washington, CKLV quarterfinals right after watching the number one team in high school. It's going to be fun. And then Saturday, you know, you get all these championships game. Bama, Georgia over. Uh, I, I love that. How does that what is, how how is there not 80 points in that game? what is that over? 55. Oh, I like that. I like that. You know why? Check out Georgia. Georgia gives up points in the first quarter all the time. And Alabama going in to to that match as an underdog. But the, here's the thing. Here, I, I, their quarterback stinks. I mean, he stinks. I mean, he absolutely stinks. That quarterback stinks. That quarterback stinks. Uh, I mean, uh, he is terrible. He is god awful. I mean, I mean, he ran for four touchdowns the other week. Auburn blew that game seven times. All you got to do, if he catches that punt, it's game over. Do you know how many? Do you know how many plays in that game that was like, just do this and the game's over? I live, bet, I live game. bet Alabama right before the the fourth and thirty play. So that that was a 
That was a huge really? win for me. Yeah. I actually saw somebody cashed out. They had Auburn money line and they cashed out right before that touchdown. So crazy. I'm excited. Great weekend of wrestling coming up. Great weekend of football coming up. This was another episode of Bash in the Brain. Any final words, Willie, before we get this up and live so everybody can listen for the weekend? Nope. You got number one team in America tomorrow night. You got Crookham Watch, Crookham Nagal Watch, Penn State, and you got Cliff Keen. Watch it all. We'll recap it for you next week. Yeah, and Penn State Lehigh is 2 p.m., and it will be on the Big Ten Network Sunday. on Sunday. Yeah. Yep, good stuff. All right, that's the episode. Like, subscribe, Bye, comment, share. We'll be back. And the beat goes on.